This is the bottom of our property, just behind this big tanker. My deadline to get out is 10 o'clock. You can see I'm cutting it short. See the whole valley is filled with smoke. The wind is slowly moving it to the north and northeast, which is bad from our standpoint. I'm going to stop down here at the entrance and check out with the deputy sheriff of Teton County. It's already come over that ridge and it's coming down the mountain pretty fast. And if the wind shifts, that would help. If it moves more to the east, it would be more down to the bottom toward the Snake River. Yeah. And that would endanger some other people, but it would help us. So, you don't know what to wish for. The best for everybody. This year doesn't look good at this point. In July 2001, an untended campfire ignited a major forest fire in Teton County, Wyoming. The Green Knoll Fire. After several years of drought conditions, the fire grew rapidly and threatened to destroy hundreds of homes. It was the realization of a worst case scenario which local fire professionals feared. Most homeowners were inadequately prepared. Due to an extraordinary effort by the firefighters and some good luck, the Green Knoll Fire was contained without loss of life or a single home. The seriousness of this fire and its frightening potential for destruction serves to remind us that we live in an area that is ecologically prone to fire. There will be more fires in the future. And we all need to be prepared. 20 to 25 percent of the homes in Teton County are in the wildland urban interface and vulnerable to the devastating effects of a wildland fire. The urban interface are houses built in forested areas. It presents a special problem to the fire department when we have a fire in one of these areas. You not only have a structure fire, but you have a wildland fire. So we have to use different strategies and operations to fight these fires. The structural protection of people are set up to handle any structures that may be threatened, and while the hand crews are putting in fire lines around the subdivision trying to keep it from coming in. It's a much tougher job to fight the fire when you have your structures involved and uh, integrated within the forest. In the urban interface, it's always, it's always a unique fire. We kind of dread the, the urban interface because there's lots of lives involved, either with the threat to a personal life or a threat to a structure. There's a wildland urban interface problem in the United States. Uh, it's not just here out in the West. Each year, our forests become more susceptible to fire. All of the wildland firefighting agencies have been very effective in the last hundred years of putting out the fires. Putting out all the fires has caused us a problem where we used to have what we call low intensity fires. We don't have low intensity fires now. Now we have high intensity types of fires. And that's how we get these big fires. It's, it's, it's an abnormal situation. All the money we spend on suppression, if we took it and did prevention and fields management, we put an awful lot of firefighters out of business. A policy of fire suppression combined with dense forests loaded with dead and dying trees increases the severity and likelihood of wildland fires. The question is not if it will happen again in Teton County, but when and where. This is a map of Teton County, and it signifies the different wild and urban interface areas that we have. Homeowners who live in these areas should be aware of wildfire and they should prepare their property and their homes in the event of a wildfire. Today's fires are more severe than the fires of the past and can move with tremendous speed. We had a Haynes index of six on the 14th of July in Salmon, Idaho and in one burning period, in three hours of that one burning period, the fire moved 24,000 acres. Oh I will guarantee you that was moving. We could not do anything but get out of the way. Uh, yesterday when we had the major movement of the fire yesterday, Haynes index of six. As a wildland fire approaches subdivisions, firefighters must make fast decisions about which structures can be saved. The more you do to protect your property, the better chance your home has of surviving. In the year 2000, wildland fires consumed 8.4 million acres and cost $1.3 billion to fight. These fires destroyed 861 homes and caused untold emotional loss. 
The experience of evacuation is like none I've ever had in my entire life. It is the most stressful, emotional experience you can imagine. And to drive away thinking that we might never see it again was just incredibly scary. It was sort of like being on a roller coaster or a yo-yo. Things were just up and down. And some days we felt no risk at all, and other days we felt like it's gone. We left in tears. We thought it would be the last time we'd see this special spot. That was surreal. Watching it burn, seeing it engulfed in smoke, and, and you know, my house is up there, and, and then at night you would see trees explode. I was awed by the power of the fire. You're worried about your home, you're worried about the firefighters, you're worried about all this, but at the same time you're looking at this and you're thinking, my God, this isn't in anybody's hands except Mother Nature's. It was awesome. It's draining thinking that your house is going to burn in, and then when they told us that it's going to run through at least 80%, you think, well, I guess our house has got a good chance of burning, but you don't really deal with the reality of a house burning, and none of us had to deal with that. And that is a horror and a grief that you can only sort of imagine. So much of ourselves went into planning and building and working, and when it just went up in one night, a part of us went to. Losing your home to a fire is a terribly devastating and life-altering event. If you know just a little bit about fire behavior, you'll know how to best protect your home from fire. Although fire is a powerful and seemingly random force of nature, there are three factors that determine its behavior. Fuel, weather, and topography. Fire needs fuel to burn. In Teton County, there are three types of wildlands. Conifer, mixed conifer and deciduous, and sage grasslands. Conifers are more susceptible to fire and burn hotter and faster than deciduous trees. When you look at uh, where a fire is going to move, when they hit groves of aspen, they slow down or even stop, but they're not continuing through the, the aerial fuels, which is what carried this fire and made it as intense as it was, was the high winds and the dry aerial fuels. Sage burns very fast. If you're doing structure protection, a sagebrush it moves fast. It's hard to keep up with it at times. It's, it's, if it's got any kind of wind behind it, it just rips out across those areas. You don't have a day and a half to prepare. You have maybe 10 minutes. Fire moves faster through dense fuels than more dispersed fuels. We have a more mature forest that's very dense. There's a huge infestation of disease and, and insects. Dead and dying fuels have less moisture content and burn more readily. Once on fire, some man-made fuels, such as what you would find in your home, burn hotter than natural fuels. The radiant heat that comes off of a fully involved structure is fairly intense. Just the concentration of fuels that you have with the structure, from the wood to the contents and, and other things that may be around with propane tanks and on-site fuel storage, that adds to that intensity. It can cause neighboring structures to uh, catch on fire. Fire needs oxygen to burn. Wind from storms and advancing weather fronts causes the fire to burn faster. Wind also causes the fire to spot ahead of the fire front, spreading the fire more rapidly. This fire is spotting. Embers are going, starting new fires. They're coming up. They're getting connected to the big fire itself. More spots. That's how this fire is burning. Hot, dry weather decreases fuel moisture. Low humidity allows fuels to dry out quicker. The drier the fuel, the easier it catches fire, and the faster it burns. In the mid to late 1800s, a lot of this area burned, and uh, that's been roughly 120, 150 years ago. And so now we're coming back on a cycle where we are going to start seeing more fires on a regular basis, uh, especially when it's mixed with drought. And because of the drought conditions over the past several years and the suppression activities, we are going to have fires. Features of the land determine the fire's direction, rate of spread, and types of available fuel. Fire tends to burn upward, consuming the available fuels in its path. The steeper the slope, the faster the fire travels. Unstable surface fuels may roll downhill, igniting lower fires. During a fire, canyons can become natural chimneys with their own microclimate, which can draw fire and rapidly accelerate its rate of spread. Slopes facing south and west receive more sun and are therefore drier. Fire generally moves up south and west facing slopes faster than east and north facing slopes. Private property owners can do a lot to help themselves. So when the fire does occur, 
we have the resources and it'll take minimal resources to protect each home and have a lot better probability of success. There are two kinds of space that people need to think about when they're protecting their home from wildfire and preparing their home for wildfire. They need to ask themselves this question, will my house survive an advancing fire front prior to fire department arrival? I call that survivable space. The second concept is defensible space, and defensible space is room for the fire department to operate once we arrive. Survivable space is preparing your home that with no intervention at all, the fire can advance toward your home and burn past your home without burning your home. When purchasing property, the choice of location is very important. Some areas are more firewise than others. If possible, avoid canyons, south-facing slopes, and areas with densely packed fuels. Since fires spread rapidly, even on minor slopes, locate your home on the most level portion of your property. When building a home on top of a ridge, set the building back from the edge at least 30 feet per story. This helps prevent your home from being hit directly by heat and flames moving up the slope. At the bottom of this, of this area in here, it's a, it's a slope. And this is where you're going to expect a fire to come up through. And that downhill side is where a fire can catch and really move quickly up towards a home. Three ways that a fire will affect a home. First of all, by direct flame impingement. If a fire moves through the ground up directly against the house, then it can catch the house on fire just because of the heat of the fire that's touching it. When building a home, create a design that is aesthetically pleasing and fire safe. Try not to put a flammable roof on or flammable siding. Make your home itself as fire resistant as you can. A non-combustible material on exterior walls should be used near ground level. Incorporate stone, concrete, and stucco materials into the design. The other way is by things embedding themselves in the roof or under a deck by embering. Non-treated wood shake roofs are the number one cause of home loss in wildland areas. Flying brands will reach a roof and we'll have a roof fire which turns into a structure fire. So a non-combustible roof is certainly recommended in the urban interface area. Preferably use non-combustible roofing materials which won't ignite and won't burn. If your roof is combustible, consider replacing it with a non-combustible roof. A less expensive but less effective alternative is treating the roof with a fire retardant coating. To prevent heat and flames from being trapped, design eaves with a minimum of overhang or box eaves. Under eave vents should be located near the roof line rather than the wall. Since fire can melt plastic mesh, cover vents with wire mesh no larger than one half inch. Probably not very good in a, in a fire situation because uh, depending on how close it burns to the house, embers and stuff can get thrown up into the vent. Use lattice to screen under decks. Building a deck that hangs over a steep slope is not recommended. Decks are a concern because embers and stuff can blow underneath those. The third way is radiant heat. And radiant heat is one of the ways that the exterior of our house will catch fire, but more importantly, it's one of the ways that things inside the house can catch fire. A structure fire inside the house is a house that we cannot save in a wildland urban interface type fire. To help protect the interior of your home, use fire retardant drapes and keep furniture and other combustible items away from the windows. On the outside, use thermal pane or tempered windows and doors. Non-combustible shutters add extra protection. Minimize the number of windows on the side of the house, usually the downhill side, that would most likely be exposed to a fire. Windows, there's not too many, they're not too large if they happen to get broken out. That's usually the biggest concern is the windows blowing out and moving the fire into the home that way. There are three principles of survivable landscaping. The first principle is horizontal space. Keep enough space between fuels, including your house, exterior furniture, trees, and shrubs. Space between trees so that the fire won't spread from tree to tree. This limits the intensity of the fire by decreasing the fuel density around your home. The second is green space, an irrigated, well-maintained landscape that can be lawn or natural. Moist green short vegetation will help slow the fire. The third principle is vertical space. Eliminate ladder fuels. Create clearance between surface fuels and tree limbs. We suggest that you use a, a zone management plan. 
Zone one is that area from the wall of your house or the, the roof line of your house basically 30 feet out. Studies have been done based on the radiant heat produced by a wildfire that 30 feet is an adequate amount of space in order for that radiant heat to not affect the combustibility of the wall. In that, that 30 feet, you want to reduce all of the things that could catch the side of the house on fire. Within zone one, within that 30 feet of defensible space is an area very close to your house that you need to concentrate some effort in, and that's about 10 feet out from your house. You need to think about the things that can embed a fire close to your house. It's not sufficient to have 30 feet of defensible space if the fuel loading so close to your house is such that if an ember got into that, it could cause your house to catch fire. It's not just the shrubbery that you may have or the landscaping, but it's the human things that you have. If you have a propane tank next to your house, move it out of zone one into zone two. If you've got your firewood stacked close to your house during the summertime, then you need to get that 30 to 50 feet out from your house, preferably on level ground. Concentrate your efforts around this 10 feet within, that, within zone one so that you limit what's there to burn. Zone two is that area 30 to 60 feet out. And in that area, you need to start thinking about reducing fuels. You need to start thinking about modifying fuels, changing the fuel bed, changing the types of plants that are in there. Use fire resistive plants. Use plants that don't burn very fast. Consider taking trees out in that area. If you've got real heavy bushy trees, especially if you've got dead trees or fallen dead trees or diseased trees, cut those trees out. Give yourself some space, both horizontally and vertically. And then zone three is that space from 60 feet to 90 feet out. And from there, you need to consider the same concepts. How much fuel do I have? How do I reduce it? Can I separate it from each other? Can I separate the trees from each other by cutting out a middle tree? Uh, all of those types of concepts are important. Let's take a practical look at applying these principles to your property. This particular property incorporates three of the very important concepts that, that we're talking about in protecting a home and in, in creating a defensible and survivable space. That is green space. As you look around, you'll see a, a green lawn that, that extends around the house. The homeowner here has spent a lot of time limbing up. He's created vertical space here, which is very, very important. That allows for a fire in smaller plants not to grow into the tree. Uh, if a fire remains on the ground, it's more compatible. You need to isolate those ground fuels so that they don't impinge upon the trees. Also horizontal space that will allow for the fire to stay away from the house. As you taper off rapidly, remember that fire burns from below. It burns, burns upwards normally. He's actually extended that zone further down the slope, which is good. A green space that's out maybe 40 to 50 feet here as opposed to 30 feet. You also notice in this space that the trees are broomed up. The steeper the slope, the higher you need to broom. Most people, when they think about wildland urban interface, they think about conifer trees or pine trees uh, and houses mixed together. Here we've got a quite a different type of interface. We, this is an intermix. In other words, it's made up of deciduous trees, undergrowth, and in pine trees as well. We can have just as serious a fire in this type of interface as we can in the conifer pine tree. We've got a beautiful fall day today. We've got a lot of leaves on the ground. We've got lots of dry grasses. We've got lots of bushes that are drying out. Uh, and we've got lots of pine trees. All of those things add fuel to the fire. A fire doesn't care what it burns. All it knows, if it's combustible, it'll burn it. So as a fire moves across this property, it's going to interface with each one of these different types of fuels. One is going to affect the other. Remember that we want to try to keep a fire on the ground. If it's on the ground, we can put it out with fire trucks. We can put it out with water and hose. If it's up in the sky, we have to put it out with airplanes and we have to put it out with helicopters. So we want to keep it low. The less fuel that you have on the ground, the slower the fire moves, especially as it advances toward your house. If you can create vertical space out here, those things that communicate with each other are, are far enough apart that the fire doesn't climb up into a tree. Horizontal space so that a clump of bush here doesn't doesn't catch this clump of brush on fire, and in green space next to your house, that will slow the fire down and will protect your house. Think about how you can incorporate fire breaks into your property. Here we have a really nice gravel path that winds its way through this landscaping. We have landscaping on this side that's relatively dense. We have landscaping behind us that's relatively dense, but yet they're separated by a non-combustible space. That allows for a good fuel break. Remember that we want you to keep your landscaping irrigated and well watered because that 
makes it more fire resistive and more fire retardant. We also suggest that if you can, can do this is to incorporate some type of a water area into your landscaping. It creates a fuel break. It creates an area where fire is not going to spread across. From a firefighting point of view, we can then use that water if necessary. One of the fuel types that can really affect your house if it burns is sage, and we have a lot of it in, in this area. What we see out here is the sage on fairly flat ground, and it can be affected in a number of different ways. You can see how tall this sage is. That adds a lot of fuel to the fire. You can also see that we have a pretty good wind blowing right now, so that as the fire moves, it, it really wind drives that fire and allows it to burn a lot faster. If you imagine this approaching your house, it's going to be affected by the height of the flame here. We could have 20 foot high flames off of this plant, and it also burns very intensely as, as it burns. Uh, as, as it tends to move very rapidly through the sage and through the grass, you can see how intensely it burns. Even those plants that are about the same size as I just had, that are heavy wood, will burn right down to nothing. And you can see that this fire has left very little vegetation. The concept that we need to concentrate most if you live in the sage grasses is horizontal space. Zone 1, next to your house, having a very limited amount of things that can burn. Zone 2, limiting those uh, the amount of sagebrush, the clustering of sagebrush, and the limiting the amount of fuels in that area, and then beyond that, limiting big clusters of sage. Well, Jeremy, I can see that you've got quite a work in progress here. Um, it, it looks like you've done all of the concepts, or you've started working on all the concepts that we, that we talk about, and that is green space, uh, which is that space immediately adjacent to your house. Also, vertical space. I can see that you've been working on a limbing project throughout your property here, and that's, that's really good. Um, and then also horizontal space. You've got some good clearance from some trees. Tell us about what your concept of what you want here is. I like living in the forest. My technique has been so far to take down a couple trees and go sit down and watch. I try to do it artfully. I've basically created this meadow from what was a very dense stand of trees. We attract owls and all kinds of wildlife to this area that weren't here before. One of the important things that, that folks can do is to take a look at their property and anticipate what, what your property is going to look like in 10 years mm -hmm. and start molding your property to look that way now. Tell me about how you, how you identify these trees. The trees are identified by whether they should be taken out entirely or whether I should just limb them. Number one, the diseased trees come out because mm -hmm. we don't want to infect the other ones. So it's all a matter of tree triage, isn't it? It is. Very, very good. Decide good analogy. Which ones go. Most importantly, you've got a non-combustible roof. You know, we're finding that one of the most important aspects of protection of a home in the wildland urban interface is what the roof is made out of. Mm -hmm. You've got good horizontal space. Again, you're using those three concepts. We're standing on green space, which is really nice, and a lot of folks would rather have a natural scape. But if it's short and green, it's a whole lot better than being very tall and brown. I also notice that you've got a limited number of combustibles up against the house where a fire could ember over and embed itself. That's really important as well. Plus you've got a tree right behind us here that's got some vertical space off the ground, off of your roof, as well as horizontal space away from the house. So you're using all of the concepts. Most folks when we start talking about wildfire mitigation, about the things that they need to do around their house, they think extraordinary things. And really all we're doing is building upon the concepts of, of the things that you're already doing. This house right here is actually pretty good. They got a good 50 feet clear around behind it. Uh, you usually want at least 30, they say 30 feet. Uh, and timber stands like this, you're gonna want more than that, probably about 50 to 75 feet clear. And that means clear of all brush. If you have a lawn, that's good. If you just have cheat grass and weeds like this, you wanna keep them kinda short and keep them fairly wet if you have a lawn. Uh, if you have log piles, firewood piles, you want to keep those away from your house, away from under your porch. Apparently, embers get into the wood pile and smolder, and then the whole wood pile ignites and it's much harder to get out. Clean up as much of the fuels as you can around your house. Plant fire-resistant plants if you can. Promote the fire-resistant trees such as aspen if you can. Particularly around homes and, and buildings that we want to preserve it, it would be good to have buffers of aspen around that. Creating and maintaining your survivable landscape is an ongoing process. Start in zone one and work outward. Remove ladder fuels, low-hanging branches, and keep ground vegetation controlled. 
Sweep accumulated leaves and other vegetation from gutters, eaves, and roof on a regular basis. Trim back branches that overhang your roof. It's very important that any chimney has a spark arrester to stop any migration of, of burning particles out of the chimney. And it's extremely important to get the chimney swept at least once a year to make sure that no chimney fires get started. A chimney fire can actually overcome a cap if it's severe enough. The grasses up here get over knee high. Really nice native grasses, so those will have to be kept down, trimmed. Uh, just like the trees will have to be kept up. But I think keeping that stuff watered to a degree, you know, the different zones will reduce fire danger as well. Um, let's keep it green. It's great when you pull up a, a driveway and come around a corner and see a nice green lawn around the house and the trees are limbed up and the vegetation is cleared away from the structure. I mean, these, these are places that uh, we like to see. The fenceable space is allowing the fire department room to work once the fire department arrives. You need to think differently. Do I have room for a fire truck to negotiate in my driveway? Do I have a water supply that the fire department can use to set up sprinklers or to protect my home? Are my lights on so that the fire department can see my house at night? Is my address visible so that they know where to go? Have I reduced the fuel loading on my property and have I created a survivable landscape? That's defensible space a spacing that we feel comfortable putting crews around and actually trying to fight the, the fire. If you have a single lane road, it's extremely difficult to get a, a structural fire truck up there and out of there. In a wildland urban interface situation, our main goal is to get into your house as quickly and as safely as possible. The roads are very narrow. There are a lot of trees hanging over them. You have a lot of switchback turns, just like the one I'm driving through now. As long as there's no traffic, that's fine, but sometimes you're gonna have four or five engines coming uphill at the same time, and that can make it a little difficult on us. So if you're gonna plan out one of these, the best thing is make sure your driveways are accessible from the road without a, a very tight turn by a fire apparatus coming in. Make sure the driveways are not too steep, as well as the road coming into it, and make sure you've cut the trees back a little bit away from the road. How are these guys gonna turn around, get out of there in case things change in a hurry? And, Sometimes they do change in a hurry. Good access and water. It's important to have plenty of exterior faucets and hoses available. A sprinkler system is a good idea, but fire department sprinkler systems have a higher capacity and are more effective. Sprinklers will protect your roof from embers. Timing is critical. Turning your system on too soon can waste precious water when demand is high and an adequate supply essential for success. I know a lot of you have been watering your roof. I might just suggest that your roof is meant to expel water. That's why it, that's why it exists. So uh, watering your roof doesn't do a tremendous amount of good on there. You can do a lot by just creating a defensible space, by moving things away from your house that will burn. That's, that you can do right now. So that if you have to leave, it's already in that condition. You have to look at your spacing of fuels. If there's tight fuels in there you can't put people in. I have to make about a 30 to 60 second decision as to which houses are going to survive which ones aren't. Uh, the more homeowners who take the time to clear defensible space around their houses, those houses go way up on, on my list of for survivability. It was the most frightening thing I've ever seen. The, the power of that fire and the black, red, swirling smoke. I know they had massive air support, but it looked like little teacups being poured on this massive plate. The power of that fire, once you see it, it's awesome. I think to think collectively as a country, we all need to look at the habitat that we're moving into. We all live where we do because we love living in the forest, and we're just going to have to come up with some ways to make it a little safer for us and the firefighters. They put their lives at risk, and it isn't fair to those people and their families to put them at risk for things that we could do to help prevent or at least reduce the risk of fire. No one's life is worth you know, a building. You can replace a building, but you can't replace a life. If you have big fires that threaten subdivisions, and they have to work, I don't know, exponentially you know, harder, 
to deal with a place that hasn't prepared for it, you put more lives at risk, which is something that none of us thought about. And I don't think it's because people are shallow. It's just that we had never been presented with it on this scale. So the more we can do to convince other people elsewhere in the community or in the country that live in mountain communities, because that's where people are moving to. I mean, it's not just your homes, it's all of that manpower. We were worried sick that some firefighter would lose his or her life. It would have taken so many people to defend this house, it would have put just the rest of the operation at risk. So, right, can feel lucky. bad. <laughs> yeah, but lucky too to get a second chance to do something. You're gonna make a compromise to have a little space to, to make your house def defendable, and I'm convinced. Wildland fire behavior near your home depends upon available fuels, weather conditions, and the topography of your property and nearby area. Create home survival space to protect you and your home before help arrives. Create defensible space to enable firefighters to protect your home after they arrive. Remember, Firewise Living is an ongoing project. Doing these things is no guarantee that wildfire won't burn your home. Doing these things will increase the chance of survivability of your home. Doing these things will protect you, it will help your fire department protect your home, it will protect your neighbor's homes, and it will protect the community that you live in. And it'll certainly help you pass the stress test when the fire comes and your neighbors and friends will admire you and respect you for helping them as well as helping yourself. It's something that people need to think about, especially if they live in a community like this where it's heavily wooded and uh, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's still beautiful. Even if it had burned, it would still be beautiful because Mother Nature would provide something else. So. Yeah, besides, where would we go? <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.